Athelstan went down in history as the last Bretwalder and the first King of England. Undoubtedly, his work as king was instrumental in achieving this recognition both by his contemporaries and by current historiography. But his legacy as a successful monarch is underpinned in part by one battle, Brunenburg. This confrontation had great repercussions in his time, and for many it is considered the origin of England, although for others the impact of this battle is considered exaggerated. In any case, Throughout this video, we will review the main keys to understand this battle, reviewing from the previous context to the repercussions of the battle. After Athelstan ascended the throne of Wessex in 927, the political landscape in Britannia would be significantly shaken. He succeeded in annexing Northumbria, which until then belonged to the Vikings, repelling the Viking king of Dublin along the way. He also extended his influence over the neighbouring Celtic kings, from the Welsh on the western border to the Kingdom of Alba and Strathclyde in the north. The power of the first King of England intimidated them and generated distrust. At any moment, Athelstan could invade their territory and attempt to subjugate them. Athelstan, who intended to forge the image of Bretwalda, a king who would rule all of Britain invited the Welsh and Scottish kings to his court. The King of Alba, Constantine II, stopped attending the councils for quite some time, according to some Anglo-Saxon sources. For this reason, Athelstan led a military campaign over Scotland in 934. This military campaign was intended as a show of force, seeking to intimidate King Constantine II by plunder and devastation. The Scottish king submitted and gave his son as a hostage, although he soon sought a military response. Constantine II was aware that he was not alone in feeling threatened by the Kingdom of Wessex, so he was quick to find allies. Among them was his kinsman Owain ap Difnwal, king of Strathclyde, and the Viking king of Dublin, Olaf Guthfrithson, who longed to regain Northumbria, previously ruled by his father. Although the military power of Wessex was, a priori, superior to each of these kingdoms individually, such a coalition could put Athelstan in check. Thus, the kingdoms of Alba, Strathclyde and Dublin undertook a joint military campaign against Wessex in the summer of 937. Athelstan was quick to respond to the invasion, gathering his army and calling up his troops as he marched against his enemies. This would not have been surprising, considering the role of Burrs in Wessex's defensive strategy since the time of Alfred the Great. They were fortifications, or fortified towns, well connected to each other, that allowed alerting the arrival of invaders. In addition, if they were garrisoned, they could provide troops to respond to attackers. In any case, although we know that this military campaign culminated with the Battle of Brunenburg, we do not know the exact point of the battle. The possible location of Brunenburg is debated today by historiography. Primary sources mention that the battle took place near Brunenburg, or a location with a rather similar name. Thanks to archaeological research and philology, several possible locations have been considered on the basis of details provided by medieval texts. Among them are Brombra on the Wirral Peninsula, a closer location for an invading fleet from Dublin, or near the estuary of the Humber River in today's Yorkshire and Humber region. In any case, what there is consensus among specialists is that the battle took place in northern Britain, at a relatively close point between the contenders. As for the development of the battle, it is difficult to pinpoint exactly how it took place. We know that Athelstan and his brother Edmund assembled their army and crossed Mercia to meet the Norse and Scots at Brunenburg in a battle that would last all day. The Norse were close to their landing zone, which they used to fortify with a palisade. 
For this reason, it is likely that the battle took place not far from the coast. The main role in the battle would fall to the infantry, as was customary in the warrior tradition of the peoples involved. Normally, they would throw projectiles at each other before engaging in close combat, although there is no mention in the sources that this occurred in the battle. What we do know, however, is that both armies engaged in shield-to-shield -shield melee against their opponents. This formation, popularly known as Shield Wall, was the most common during the High Middle Ages in Western Europe. The duel of the infantry finally went in favor of the Anglo-Saxon side, perhaps supported in part by the pressure exerted by the cavalry. Although the cavalry at that time had a secondary role, as normally the Anglo-Saxon nobles used horses to ride into battle and then fight on foot, this battle emphasizes the pressure exerted in battle. The outcome of the battle brought heavy casualties, with several nobles on both sides dying, especially in the Norse Scottish army. The Norse were driven into the sea, the survivors returning with their fleet to Dublin. Among them was Olaf himself, who managed to survive the battle. Constantine also survived and managed to return home, but Owain would not meet the same fate. The Anglo-Saxon victory at Brunanburh had a decisive short-term impact. On the one hand, it guaranteed the stability of the Kingdom of Wessex. The Scottish kingdoms, while retaining their independence, definitively recognized the superiority of Athelstan. The Dublin Vikings, for their part, would also not return to England for the rest of his reign. A defeat at Brunanburh would in all probability have meant the dissolution of the union of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms achieved by Athelstan. However, the impact of the battle would not last beyond the reign of Athelstan, who would die in 939. Without going any further, that same year, Olaf Guthrithson himself took the throne of Northumbria, initiating a period where Anglo-Saxons and Vikings would alternate on the throne until 954. The Wessex kings, although they sought to expand and preserve the legacy of Athelstan, began to be overtaken by Viking invasions from Denmark and Norway in the late 9th century. For these reasons, there are some historians who question the real impact of Brunanburh's victory, dismissing it as exaggerated. True, military successes were always likely to be exaggerated for propaganda purposes. Still, considering the enemies he faced and the possible repercussions of a defeat, it is not surprising that this victory was considered decisive. After all, it was the triumph at Brunanburh that allowed Athelstan to be considered the last Bretwakda and the first King of England for historiography. Don't close the video yet. If you like everything related to the medieval period, this is your site. If you found this video interesting and would like to see more videos, subscribe, leave us a like and write in the comments what other battle or character you would like to see in the channel. This will help us to grow and keep creating much more content. Now with nothing more to say, we say goodbye.